Chapter 4 is Hormonal Control During Exercise. So we're talking about biological control, and there are two biological control systems in the body. One of them we've already talked about, which is the nervous system, okay, and we talked about that in Chapter 3. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the other nervous system, which is the endocrine system. So when we go from rest to exercise, we increase the amount of work that we're doing. And in order to do more work, we need more ATP. Okay, so when we exercise, we increase the need for ATP. Another way of saying that is that we increase the demand for ATP. Okay, and therefore, our metabolic rate must increase to meet this increased meet need. Okay, so what we need is an increase in the supply of ATP. Okay, we need supply and demand to be equal. And so the way the body matches supply to demand is with the control systems. So the control systems are monitoring the environment and when they sense an increased demand, through sensory motor integration, they are going to send out responses to various systems in the body in order to increase the supply of ATP. Okay. And we've already talked about you know, all the things we need to do. If we need to get more ATP, then we need to supply more glucose. So we're going to need to break down more glycogen. We're going to need to supply more fat. So we're going to break down more triglycerides. We need to supply more oxygen, so our breathing rate is going to go up. Our heart rate is also going to go up so that we can deliver the oxygen, the carbohydrate, the fat at greater rates. So the biological control systems are responsible for increasing the supply of whatever is needed in order to the meet the demand of whatever is needed in order to maintain a homeostatic environment. Now the nervous system and the endocrine system work together to control the physiological processes that required that are required to perform exercise. So they're partners, they work together. Um, the primary difference is that the nervous system starts the response. It's a very quick response. Messages send with an, ele an electrical signal, um, but be even though it has a quick effect, um, well, I should say, although it has a quick effect, it also has a very short-lived effect because you can withdraw that signal as fast as you can send the signal, okay, because electrical signals can change very rapidly. The endocrine system is slower, okay, so the endocrine system kicks in, it's going to have the same goal as the nervous system, but it's going to be a slower effect it's going to be responsible for more fine-tuning okay, to get the supply fine-tuned exactly where the demand is. Um, and it's going to be a longer-lasting effect because the endocrine system sends messages through chemicals called hormones and they take a while to be secreted, to get into the blood, to travel wherever they need to send their signal and so the effect is going to be longer lasting because it's also slower to bring those chemicals back um, to take them away from the area where they're causing a response. So nervous system starts the response, quick effect, short-lived. Endocrine system is a slower effect. It's responsible for more fine-tuning, um, and it's a longer-lasting effect. So three basic uh, components of the endocrine system, we have um, endocrine glands, we have hormones, and we have hormone receptors on target tissues. So endocrine glands are responsible for producing and secreting the hormones. Okay. Hormones are proteins. Um, and chemical 
messengers. Okay. So chemical messengers that travel through the blood, um, they're going to leave the endocrine gland. They're secreted by the endocrine gland into the blood, and they carry a message out to a target tissue. Okay. And target tissues have receptors for those hormones. So if you have a hormone that looks like this, you may have a receptor that looks like this. And then the hormone goes to the receptor on the target tissue. Okay. And relays whatever this message is that needs to be sent to that target tissue so that the target tissue can respond. So we're talking about the endocrine system specific to exercise. So the two major functions of the endocrine system during exercise, one is to regulate energy metabolism. Okay, so what is energy metabolism? It's making ATP. Okay, so the endocrine system is an important factor in the regulation of ATP production. Increasing ATP production to increase supply to meet the increased demand that is occurring during exercise. And our hormones work very closely to ensure that we have enough glucose and free fatty acids available to make ATP. And that's what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Another function of the endocrine system during exercise is regulation of body fluids and electrolytes. It is covered in this chapter, however, we will not cover it this semester. All right, so there are a lot of hormones in this chapter. Uh, we are only going to talk about four of them, um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, insulin, and glucagon. So let's first start with the adrenal gland. Okay, and this is the adrenal glands are endocrine glands, and they are located on the top of each kidney. Okay, and they they produce and secrete several hormones. Uh, the two that we're going to talk about are epinephrine and norepinephrine. And most cells in the body are targets for epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, if you read the book, you'll see that epi and norepi have slightly different responses, uh, but we're not going to differentiate between them. They, they work together, they work for similar goals, so we're going to combine them together and we're going to talk about their combined effect. So... Um, together, in this chapter, whenever I say epi, I'll say norepi, epi, norepi. So we're combining them. So what controls epi and norepi secretion? What causes epi and norepi to be secreted from the adrenal gland? Well, there's three different things. One is the CNS, the autonomic nervous system. Uh, more specifically, the SNS. So when we get an SNS drive, a signal is sent to the adrenal gland, and the adrenal gland starts secreting epi and norepi. And we'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. Um, baroreceptors. So remember, baroreceptors are monitoring pressure. So when we get changes in blood pressure, this can affect the secretion of epi nor epi. Okay, and we're going to talk about that uh, much more in the cardiovascular chapter. And then the third factor that affects epi nor epi secretion are chemoreceptors, okay, primarily because of changes in glucose in the blood. So when blood glucose levels in the blood change, these are detected by chemoreceptors, 
and this is going to have effect on epi nor epi secretion. And we'll talk more about this. So the major functions of epi nor epi are to augment and prolong the effects of the SNS. Okay, remember they're partners; they're working together. So SNS is going to cause effects. One of the things that SNS is going to do is it's going to cause epi nor epi to be secreted. And that is going to augment and prolong the effects of SNS. And that goes back to table 3.1 that we talked about in chapter 3. Um, it's on the next slide, but for now, um, those are on that slide, you'll see the effects of SNS. And epi nor epi are going to augment and cause those same effects and prolong those effects. Another function of epi nor epi is in blood pressure regulation. Okay? So they're affected by changes in blood pressure, um, and therefore they are partly responsible for um, regulating blood pressure. And then the third is blood glucose regulation. Okay, and I, again, I told you there's chemoreceptors that are monitoring glucose levels in the blood. And so epi nor epi are partly responsible for making sure that glucose levels in the blood stay where they need to be. So here you have that table, and these are the effects of the SNS. Okay, but epi nor epi our partners with SNS. So whatever SNS does, epi and norepi also does, causes the same effect. It's a slower response, but it's a prolonged response, and it's more fine-tuning. So SNS is going to get these things started. Epi and norepi are going to keep these things going, and fine-tune the response so that supply and demand are precisely matched. All right, this one we are going to talk about in class, but you might want to look at this and give this some thought. What do you think happens when epi and norepi are secreted? What do you think happens to these factors? Okay. Keep in mind that epi nor epi work with SNS. Okay? They are fight or flight hormones. Okay? Their function is to prepare you to do work. Okay? And if you're going to do work, you need ATP. If you're going to get ATP, you're going to need oxygen, you're going to need glucose, you're going to need FFA. Okay? So think about that when you think about how these things change when epi and norepi are secreted. Okay? Because all of these systems have target receptors for epi and norepi, and when they bind, they cause these things to change, either to increase or decrease. And it's all very logical. So go through it and see if you can figure out what happens to each of these things when epi and norepi are secreted. All right, the other two hormones we're going to talk about are insulin and glucagon. They come from the pancreas. And the pancreas is located slightly behind and below the stomach. The pancreas secretes uh, multiple hormones, but the two that we're going to talk about are insulin and glucagon. All cells in the body are targets for insulin and glucagon. So what controls the secretion of insulin and glucagon? What causes them to be secreted? Okay, again, chemoreceptors, more specifically, chemoreceptors that are monitoring blood glucose. So when blood glucose levels go up or down, so they go away from homeostasis, this is going to cause secretion of either insulin or glucagon with the goal of <clears throat> bringing glucose levels back to normal. So the function is blood glucose regulation. Okay. 
The CNS and the autonomic nervous system also um, do cause the secretion of insulin and glucagon. Okay. Um, and so we'll refer to that briefly. But the primary function of insulin and glucagon is blood pressure, I'm sorry, blood glucose regulation. So the chemoreceptors are helping blood glucose regulation, and as you'll see, the CNS also is contributing to the maintenance of blood glucose regulation. All right. We're going to talk about this in class, but again, um, for now, I want you to think of insulin as a storage hormone. Okay, It's an anabolic hormone. It promotes storage. It's secreted after you eat. Okay, so... Think about these. See if you can answer these, but we'll be doing this in class. Glucagon is a catabolic hormone. It causes breakdown. Okay. It's the opposite of insulin. Insulin is anabolic and it causes storage. Glucagon is catabolic and it causes breakdown and release. Okay, so where insulin is going to cause fat and carbohydrate to be stored, glucagon is going to cause fat and carbohydrate to be broken down and released to make it available. Okay, so just keeping that in mind, see if you can answer these questions. So the hormones that we've talked about, insulin, glucagon, epi, nor epi, their role is to work together to make sure that there's adequate glucose and FFA available in order to make ATP. Okay. We'll talk about this in class, but again, before class, I want you to think about these questions. The rest of these slides we will we'll discuss in class.